Hello, my name is Jonah Albert and I'm a cultural event producer at the British Library. And I would like to welcome you to this special event to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. It is our pleasure to have Ava Slosh in conversation with Tim Robertson this evening. We would like to extend a warm welcome to those of you joining us from the Living Knowledge Network, a network of libraries across the country. But before we start, some housekeeping. Above me, you will see three tabs. You can use one of them to buy Ava's book, the other to donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity. And the third to send us feedback, particularly on our virtual events. Below the video, you can see a form that will enable you to send questions, which Ava will answer towards the end of the event. The event is being speech to text captioned. You can turn this on by clicking on the tab below the video. Please welcome Tim Robertson, who has been the Chief Executive of the Anne Frank Trust UK since 2018. His previous roles included Director of the Royal Society of Literature and Chief Executive of Kessler Trust for Arts in Prison. He's also been a children's social worker in the London Borough of Camden. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Robertson. Jonah, thank you very much indeed for that welcome. Um, everybody watching, it's going to be my great honour this evening to introduce you to Eva Schloss. Um, as Jonah said, I uh, am the Chief Executive at the Anne Frank Trust UK, uh, and it's a real personal pleasure for me to be at the British Library again. I live just across the street on Judd Street, and I've had a long connection with the, with the library in my previous role at the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, we set up an events partnership with the library, which is still flourishing. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, and the library also has some connection with Anne Frank. You may know that in the forecourt, there is a tree planted in Anne Frank's memory, and there are no fewer than two statues of Anne Frank inside the library. Pray God for the day when we can all actually get into the building again. Uh, both of them, uh, one in, near the education centre, one downstairs, both of the bronze statues of Anne Frank. Uh, now, Anne Frank was uh, and her family were Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany. And they fled in the mid 1930s to Holland uh, and only to find that Holland was invaded by the Nazis in 1940. And a couple of years after that, when anti-Semitism had completely taken over the society around them, they were forced into hiding and they hid for with four other Jewish people, so uh, um, Anne and her parents and her sister, uh, for nearly two, uh, for over two years, uh, the time when Anne Frank was aged 13 to 15, during which time she wrote a diary about her experiences. But the Franks were betrayed and deported by the Nazis to concentration camps, and all of them died apart from uh, Anne's father Otto and they were among the six million Jewish people who were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust uh, along with millions of people others whom the Nazis deemed to be unacceptable human beings uh, and the worst of those uh, death camps where the, the Nazis sent people was Auschwitz which was liberated by the Soviet army on the 27th of January 1945 and the 27th of January is the date that we mark as Holocaust Memorial Day uh, which is actually in a couple of days time uh, and in fact this year uh, the, 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 the national event for Holocaust Memorial Day run by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust is open to all of us you can go online to see that event if you want to and the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust have asked for all of us to light a candle in our windows at eight o'clock uh, on Thursday evening to remember those who perished in the Holocaust and in subsequent genocides. Yes. Anne Frank, though, after the war, her diary was discovered and published, and it's gone on in three ways to become quite astonishing, culturally, politically, and educationally. Culturally, the most astonishing world phenomenon, 36 million copies sold, one of the most beloved books in the world, radio programs, TV programs, films, an astonishing array of different cultural manifestations. 
politically an inspiration to J.F. Kennedy, to Barack Obama, to Nelson Mandela, to Vaclav Havel, to all kinds of uh, liberal uh, and liberating thinkers and leaders, and educationally. And uh, there are Anne Frank education organizations all around the world. And at the Anne Frank Trust UK, we are the one that's the British branch. And we uh, take Anne Frank's story into schools across Britain and use that as a means to educate about all forms of prejudice and discrimination. We have workshops on anti-Semitism, homophobia, Islamophobia, sexism, and, uh, and so on. And our Anne Frank Young Ambassadors become amazing spokespeople for a fairer and more equal world. But they're always grounded in that knowledge of the Holocaust. Uh, and we were founded by a survivor of the Holocaust, by Eva Schloss. And Eva's story, as you will hear this evening, intersects in various ways with Anne Frank's and is different in some other ways. Uh, and um, you, uh, Eva will, is going to talk for about 40 minutes to tell her story. And uh, she will then answer some questions, which you have on your screen, the details of how to submit your questions to us. Uh, and if you want to know more about Eva, you'll see also that you can buy her book. She's written three books, actually, but uh, the, the, the latest and, uh, and the, the fullest of telling her story is called After Auschwitz. Uh, and so uh, it's my very great pleasure, as always, to welcome the co-founder and honorary president of the Anne Frank Trust UK, Eva Schloss. Eva. Where will you begin your story? I would imagine in your childhood in Vienna in the 1930s. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's an honor for me to be speaking in the British Library. And um, yes, I have a big story, unfortunately, rather sad. Um, I actually usually start, like you say, in, in Vienna, but as this is a different kind of talk because we remember the liberation of Auschwitz. And I am one of the very, very few, if at all, any more people who were there and have survived till this day. Um, and so I really would like to start with sort of the end of this terrible part of my life. But it wasn't quite the end because you will hear in my story. Um, it was February, um, um, it was, sorry, it was January 1945. The camp Auschwitz had been partly evacuated already. Many, many days, Nazis took uh, empty barracks in the men camp and the women's camp. I was actually in Birkenau. If you have ever been to those complexes of camps. There were many, many camps. There were Auschwitz main camps, a big one. Then was Birkenau, which was um, very, very big, but it was different. It was constructed just in 1940 for more prisoners. And it was very basic, just wooden barracks with um, Arabis, no furniture in it, no toilets in, no water in it, and um, very, very primitive, quite different from Auschwitz, which was proper brick buildings with um, single bunks and as well washrooms and uh, tables and cupboards where people could be their belongings. So um, we realized it was winter, it was very, very cold, the snow was perhaps a meter high, and uh, very often we walked without shoes. I had terrible frostbite on my feet. I could hardly walk. I was at the time in a barrack together with my mother. Later, I will tell you, it wasn't always the case. And um, we didn't know what was going on. Sometimes we were called to work. Sometimes we were stayed in the barracks. It was chaos. And then one night, the Nazis called out again. We were in the barrack trying to sleep and said, everybody out. We are going to leave the camp. We are going to march. And um, 
So everybody got out of the bed. My mother was very, very weak. We stood in the cold, shivering, hardly with any clothes on. And then there was an air raid. The Russians obviously were near and were investigating this area. So um, they said, we are not marching. We can't walk, march in an air raid back. And this was the whole night, in and out, in and out. Um, after about five, six attempts like this, my mother said, I just can't get out anymore. We'll just stay. We take a chance on it. And I said, okay, I was as well exhausted. And we fell asleep, deep sleep. And in the morning we woke up and it was very, very quiet. We went to look at outside. The camp was practically empty. So there were about three, four barracks where there were still some people, and that was it. So the gates were open. We could have gone, but where are we going? The, uh, the population outside was not welcoming to us. We knew that. So there were some Polish prisoners who did go, but most people stayed. We were 10 days still on our own. And many, many people died. I was one of the few people with a Polish woman who had still the strength to take those dead bodies out. And we just had to heap them up outside in the snow. We couldn't do anything else with them. And then one day again, we were looking around, see if we can find some bits of food on the ground. And there stood an enormous creature um, at the gate. And it was the first Russian soldier coming to investigate. He came into the camp. He had no idea what he was going to find. Um, again, some Polish people could speak to him. He explained he was just a scout, but the army will follow. He's going back to tell the army that there are no Nazis here anymore, that it is safe for them to advance. And this is what happened. Within the next day, Suddenly the Russians came with their field kitchen, with tanks, with horses and um, stayed the night, they put the field kitchen up and fed us. You can't imagine what this meant for us. We haven't had food um, for many months even, just bits of peas, a bit of bread, um, but now hot, wonderful cabbage soup. And, we, and they gave us as much as we wanted. And we ate and ate and ate. Um, the soldiers were singing. It was, you know, it was wonderful. We said, well, now it's the end. We'll go probably home soon and everything will be good. But of course, it wasn't at all like that. Um, in the morning, the Russians were gone. Um, I sat the whole night on a bucket. My the food went just straight through me because I just couldn't digest it. And in the morning again, many people had died from overeating. So we stayed again for a few days. And then I said to my mother, well, we can't stay like this. We'll all die. And I'm going to go to Auschwitz to the main camp to try to find my father and brother. So there was a French girl, he said, I come with you. So we did. And it was about three miles. We went in the, in the dark because there was still fighting around. We heard bullets flying around and shooting and all that. So we went eventually, we arrived in Auschwitz and the Russians had made a headquarters there that was more civilized with proper barracks, like I told you. And um, I asked permission if I can look in the barrack to try to find my father and brother. So there again, um, many barracks where we saw a few people sitting outside, standing, walking. They didn't know what to do, where to go. And um, I looked all over the place. And then I saw a man standing there, um, very pale, very old, looking lost. And I went to him and I said, you look familiar to me. He said, yes, I'm Otto Frank, Anna's father. And you, I think you're Eva Geiringer, Anna's friend. I said, yes, yes. Have you seen my girls? Have you seen my wife? No, I never saw them. 
have you seen Heinz and my father? Because he knows them. He said, yeah, they were here, but a few weeks ago, they left with the Nazis when they were evacuating the camp. So good news. Um, the war can't last long, they'll be all right. So I went back and fetched my mother. And so we had to stay a few weeks in Auschwitz. And then the Russians decided they wouldn't leave us there. They went, would take us eastward safe. And that is what happened. We traveled for four months with the Russians till May. Can you imagine? Still in cattle trucks, the same. Is it, uh, the doors were left open a little bit. There was a stove there. Um, they gave us food. There were no toilets. So when the train stopped, we could go out and relieve ourselves. Um, we went through different villages. We saw unbelievable devastation. Wherever we went, um, the Germans had ruined everything. We went partly through Russia, then to Romania, and eventually in May. So from February till May, we traveled this way, and um, we ended up in Odessa. Um, we still had only the clothes which we had left Auschwitz with, and the Russians gave us, they gave us Russian uniforms. Um, I was very proud of this. Um, this was actually photographed after when we got back, but um, this is what, that is what it was. Very solid, very well made, because a woman's uniform, because there were a lot of women in the Russian army at the time. So anyway, um, this is 27th of January, that's how it started. And um, it was not the end of the world, and it was not the end of the war either. So, and then of course a long journey till eventually we got back to Amsterdam in June. And there we were very lucky we were able to get into our apartment. But I just want to tell you something. Otto Frank was one of the survivors. And if he wouldn't have been survived like me at the time, the diary would never have been published. So, you know, this was really a wonderful for Otto to be surviving and be able to get the diary and what he did with it was really another miracle. Well, I hope we will have time to come to this towards the end of my story. So I go back now to the beginning, Vienna, where um, I was born in 1929 in a very young, wonderful family. I had an older brother. We had grandparents, aunt, uncle, cousins. Um, our family has been in Austria for generations. Um, it was a beautiful country. And as well, um, it used to be the, one of the, I think even the most powerful empire in Europe for many, many, many years, the Austrian empire. But after the first world war, they lost most of those power and Austria became a very, very small, simple country, quite poor. But nevertheless, the Kaiser invited from, had invited from all this big empire, um, artists, doctors, musicians, poets, painters. So it was a very, very cultured, wonderful country and beautiful with mountains and lakes. So my father and me, we were the daredevils. We were always going in the mountain, doing dangerous excursions. My brother and my mother, were anxiously waiting for the um, little restaurant in the neighborhood. Um, that is one of the pictures. There are very few parents. pictures of my father because my father usually took the pictures. But in this case, probably my brother took it. Um, so we were Hi. very, very happy. But all this changed in um, March 1938. I just turned... Um, nine years old, Heinz was 12 years old, when without permission, without announcing, the Nazis marched into Austria and occupied that country. And we were amazed and shocked because even our friends stood in the street 
with a swastika swastika flags and with the Heil Hitler's road. My first experience of anti-Semitism after school, I went um, to my best friend who was a Catholic girl. And um, when the mother saw me, she said, we never want to see you here again. And she slammed the door in my face. I went home crying. I said to my mother, we didn't have a quarrel. What is the matter? My mother said, well, for Jewish people, life is going to be very hard and very difficult. My brother came home from school, 12 years old. His clothes were torn. His face was covered in blood. And when my parents asked, Heinz, what happened to you? He said, my friends did that. And the teachers watched it happening. Can you imagine? So my father, who had inherited a shoe factory from his father and had connections with Holland, because there was a big shoe industry in the south of Holland, um, <clears throat> immediately left. That was still possible. But of course, to, a whole family couldn't really leave. He said, I will try to find accommodation and then hopefully you can all follow. But by the time that was 1938, already many countries had taken in refugees from Germany. But so in 38, it was very difficult, practically impossible, unless you were a very famous person. England, America accepted famous people, but ordinary people they just didn't give any visas to those people. So we couldn't go. So um, eventually we heard we could go illegally to Belgium. So that's what we did. And we ended up in Brussels in 1939. My father still lived in South Holland. And so he came to visit his weekends. And, um, but in the meantime, Hitler went into Czechoslovakia and Poland and the war started, 1940. And my father tried desperate to get a visa for us to come to the Netherlands. Eventually in um, February, 1940, during the war, we got a visa for three months to visit my father in Holland. And we moved to a big square. Um, I don't think I have a photo of this, but it is well known because other refugees lived there and one of them was a Frank family. And we were both 11 years old at the time. And if you live in apartments, there were no gardens to play. So all the children played in the street. So um, one day, a little girl came to me, introduced herself. Um, her name was Anne Frank. And she took me right away up to her apartment because she couldn't speak German anymore. And she was four years old when she came to Holland. And she introduced me to her dad, um, who could speak German to me. And I right away um, liked him. He was, an, in my mind at the time, an elderly gentleman because my father was just 40 and Otto was already in the 50s but very, very kind. He spoke German with me. He said, anytime you want to come and have a conversation with me, just tell Anna and we'll be friends. So that was all very nice. We settled down. When I told Anna I had an older brother, she said, oh, when can I come and meet him? Because <laughs> already with 11, she really liked boys. So nothing came of this actually. But anyway, we were very happy in Amsterdam. My brother, he got, had a guitar in this furnished apartment, was a piano. He right away started to play again. And um, life seemed good again. And the Dutch were very welcoming. We enjoyed life. That is <laughs> on the steps where you went into the apartment in the Merveda plan. And um, yeah, we... We were happy, but very short, because in May, the Germans invaded Holland as well. Um, I won't go too much into that. It was a short war, five days, and the Dutch capitulated, and we tried still to escape, but there was no chance that we were occupied. Occupation, the first year was not too bad. 
But the second year in 1941, it became already very, very bad for Jewish people. We had to wear the yellow star. We had many restrictions. Um, we had to give in the bicycle. We were not allowed to have a radio. We had to be in at eight o'clock and people started to disappear. So it was very scary. Then we had to leave our school and go into Jewish schools, which by itself, nothing wrong with that. But again, the Nazis wanted to kill the young people first. So they went into the schools with trucks, um, told the children to go on the truck. And the parents waited in the afternoon for the children to come home and they didn't turn up. So they went to the police, no answer. And the children were never ever seen again. Only after the war, we heard that they were sent to Mauthausen, a terrible Austrian death camp, and just thrown down from the cliffs. The Dutch have a big, beautiful monument there for all those hundreds of young Dutch people and as well refugee kids, children who perished there quite early in the war, really. And um, so life went on. And then um, in 1942, about 10,000 youngsters between the age of 16 and 20, and 20 25, 26, got the call up notice to be deported to Germany. That was for Heinz Gottset and Margot and his older sister. And that was the time when both parents and many, many other parents decided we would go into hiding. So my father called us together and said, Heinz, you're not going. I found some wonderful Dutch people who are willing to keep us staying with them as long as the war lasts and to keep us safe. But you know, the apartments are quite small. I, I couldn't found, find uh, people who were going to take in four people. So we have to split up. And um, I will go with mother and um, um, Heinz will go with my, me, my father said. And I started to cry. I didn't want to be separated. And my father explained, if we are in two different places, the chance that two of us will survive is bigger. Survive. That was the first time that I realized it might be a matter of life and death. And that is pretty scary. Well, Heinz being so gentle and so sensitive, he was very afraid of dying. And he asked Papi, um, I'm afraid of dying. What will happen when we die? And my father said, well, this is what happens. We all have to die. But, um, you know, if you have children, you will live on in your children. And then Heinz said, but what if I die before I have any children? And my father thought for a moment and he said, well, Whatever you have done in your life, even in a short life, somebody will remember because we are all in a um, link, in a big chain, which goes from generation to generation and nothing gets lost. So you won't be forgotten. Well, that is what he had to accept. And me too, of course. <laughs> and um, so then we went into hiding. We were two years in hiding with different people. I won't tell you too much about it because time is running out. There's so much to tell. And um, after two years, we were betrayed by a Dutch nurse who was a double agent. She pretended she worked for the resistance, but she was really working for the Nazis. It was in um, 11th of May, 1944, my, 11, my 15th birthday. And um, we were taken away. Um, so we were in two different places. It's a complicated story. I can't go into details. But anyway, we were both betrayed and sent to Westerbork and put on transport. So of course, they never told you what is going to happen to you. 
So we had no idea where we were going. It could have been a work camp, could have been a desk camp, could have been in Poland, in Germany. We had no idea. Um, you know, of course, it were cattle trucks, terrible transportation, about 80 people, um, two buckets, one for toilets, one for clean water. Uh, once a day, we got chunks of bread thrown in like you would feed wild animals. So terrible. That was probably the last conversation I had with Heinz. He told me because in hiding, he started to paint and write poetry. He said before they escaped from this woman who black, that's a long story, black made him. Um, he hits the uh, paintings under the floorboard with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz Geiringer. And after the war, I'm going to pick it up again. And then he said, Eva, if I don't make it, please go and pick the paintings up because they are really very, very nice. You will be amazed what I've created. So, and then we arrived in Auschwitz. First selection, men and women to different sides. So this is when we had to say goodbye, which you can imagine was a very, very emotional thing. And then the women um, stand in rows of five and Mengele came, looked you over in a fraction of a second, he decided life or death, right or left. Eva, could you just explain Mengele? Just explain who he was, would you? Mengele was officially a, a, a medical doctor and um, he was supposed to look after the ill people because was, he wasn't. There was in Birkenau a big barrack, which was the hospital. And he, people, if they were ill, because within days, people got typhus, dysentery because the water which we got was unclean. So you can imagine in the fields, and as I said, in our barracks, um, there was no washing facilities. So forget about washing. We were full of lies. But first, of course, the people who were still not going to be killed went into a huge, huge barracks. The next thing was undressed completely naked. We were shaved, we were tattooed. Um, we had to register what job we had, what, how old we were, from which country we came, all kinds of things. It took many, many, many hours. And we stood there naked, shivering, so it was hot. And um, not knowing what's going to happen to us. And while this happened, they told us with lots of pleasure, the people who had been selected, all the people, and of course, all the children. There were about, I think, 46 children in our transport. And that <clears throat> was researched later, and only six of those survived. And I was one of the six. So um, they told us the family that you have been separated from went for a shower. And then they started to laugh and pushing each other. Um, but of course, it wasn't a shower. They were guests. Can you imagine a mother who had been just separated from her child, how she felt? So people started to cry and to scream, and it was awful. And then eventually we were let out, still naked, and we marched to a heap of a mountain of clothes, and we got one garment. Could have been a winter coat or a dressing gown, no underwear, nothing. And the next heap were shoes, two shoes, a boot and a slipper, whatever. And that was all our belonging. We worked from morning to night. We got only in the morning a little bit of liquid, in the evening a chunk of bread. <clears throat> we were full of lies. Um, we worked very, very hard. People collapsed. We were 10 sleeping in a bunk on, a, on wood. There was nothing, no blanket, no straw, no pillow, nothing. And um, <clears throat> very often um, you wanted to keep your bread for the next day. So you put it under your head to sleep on. And very often in the morning, the people who slept next to you had eaten it away from under you. 
So very often we woke up and the person next to you was, had died in the night. So the conditions were unbearable. Many, many, many people died all the time. And then it became kind of autumn, very, very cold. And um, once a week we had a shower and we were deloused because we were full of lies. And um, when we came out, um, Mengele stood there, still naked, and we had to parade in front of him. And he decided who was still able to work or who wasn't. And I passed, my mother followed, and he, she was like any mother, she had very often shared her little bit of bread with me. And she was very thin, it didn't look too good. And he with 40 other Dutch women from our transport was selected to be killed. So the women marched out naked and I thought, I will never ever see my mother again. So this was for me the worst moment in the camp. Um, mm -hmm. It became winter. I had um, snow was high. I had very often lost my shoes. I had frostbite on my feet, could hardly walk anymore. And I must admit, I was on the point of giving up. I said, my mother is not alive. I have no idea if my father and Heinz is alive. What on earth should I do alone if I should survive? I was desperate and I was starving and ill and, and many people from the Dutch transport had already, that was already the time when the Germans had started to evacuate the camp. So, and I sat at my work and I was called out by a couple and I thought, well, now they want to kill me. And I go out and there stood my father. Unbelievable. Never happened to anybody that a man came in to ask for a family member. He came with his SS boss. My father was a big charmer. You know, he was, um, he obviously, he told me he works in a timber factory and he has done very well. So he was respected by the Nazis. So obviously he got this privilege to, to but how they could find me where they were. They had um, actually a, amazing administration, but still, but of course it was wonderful. But the next question of my father was, where is Muti? And I burst into tears and I told him she had been selected, she's guest. Well, this strong man who never gave in to anything started tears were rolling around his, down his eyes. And he said, well, first he was speechless, but then he said, the war will soon be over. over. Hans is okay. Please, please hold on. We'll be together still. And then I never saw him anymore. And then another miracle happened because this is what I have to point out. There were many, many miracles. Otherwise, I wouldn't sit here. Um, obviously, I told you the Germans started to leave already. There was not no organization very often. There was no work. And um, so I walked around not knowing see if I find a bit of food perhaps on the ground. And um, I saw some Dutch people from our transport coming from another part of the camp. And they said to me, they've seen my mother. Of course, I didn't believe it, but it was true. And that is, of course, a long story. My mother actually write it herself in my first book, Eva's story. She was saved and brought back to the living and um, she was still alive. And so eventually I was able to go to the same barrack where she was, because I said there was not much supervision anymore. And so that is, I go back now to the beginning of um, 27th of January, that what happened then when the Russians came. And um, as I say, Otto was with us. And when we were in Odessa, then eventually we celebrated the end of the war, 8th of May. And then what now? We are middle of Russia in Odessa. How do we get back? But it was all organized 
haben sie was halt New Zealand Troop Transport Ship came and it brought us back to Marseille and then up to Holland and eventually in June we got back to Amsterdam again. And what now? We didn't know where to go and they didn't look after us. They just dropped us there and that was it. The first time after so long we had to look after ourselves. So my mother said, well, let's just go in the tram and let's go to um, friends who was a mixed marriage. Perhaps they're still there. The husband was a Jew and his wife was Christian. Perhaps they're still there. So we took a tram. Nobody bothered. We couldn't pay. We had nothing, of course, and went to this address. And yes, they were still there, the Rosenbaums. And he let us in and um, welcomed us and said, well, where is Heinz and Eric? Um, they were best friends of us. And they said, well, we are waiting for their return. But eventually we decided we will look if perhaps we can go back into our apartment because it was not our apartment, it was furnished belonging to a person. And this woman let us back in again. That was very exceptional because Otto, when he came back, other people had lived in his apartment. All the furniture was sent to Germany, all the things which was there to help the cities who had been bombed. And, um, and then Otto came to us one day and he told us the terrible news that his whole family had perished. After he left, I sat on my mother's lap and we cried. And I said to my mother, how can this poor man carry on with his life? He has nothing to live for. And a few days later, he came again with a little brown parcel under his arm. And you can guess what it was. It was Anna's diary. And he opened it very carefully. And he said, can I read a few sentences? And he read, but he always burst into tears. It was too emotional. Well, you know what happened then. He published it and it became eventually, not immediately, when it was published in America in 1952, it became a bestseller. And from then on, it just grew and grew and grew. And we got as well the notice that Heinz and my father on the death march perished. Um, my father in March and Heinz on the 16th of, no, 26th of April, just 10 days before the Americans came to liberate that camp. That was something I just couldn't cope with. I became full of hatred, I became depressed, and I wanted to want, listen to that. I wanted to commit suicide. I was so desperate, so I survived because I thought life will go eventually back to ordinary life. But I realized that will never ever happen. I found it very, very difficult to make a life again. And Otto came to us very often and he who had lost everything had no hatred. He had long discussion together. I told him how I hate everybody and he spoke to me. He didn't hate, not even the Germans. He expressed everything to me. Um, and he became very helpful for my mother. My mother became very helpful to him. They became friends. He looked after me. He was a good sort of replacement father for the time being. Um, he always told me stories about Anne. And um, eventually when I finished school, um, Otto and my mother decided I should become a photographer. And um, Otto got me a job in London and um, I went to London for one year to become an apprentice. And in London, I met a young man and in the boarding house who had come to London to study economic from Israel. And, you know, we were very poor. We didn't have money and we didn't know England. We didn't know anybody in England. And so we went for long walks. And after six months, he said to me, Eva, I fall in love with you. Will you marry me? And when I finished my studies, we can go to Israel and start a new life. And I said to him, no, thank you. He was a little bit shocked, 
But um, I said, well, I have a widowed mother in Amsterdam. And, you know, we were very close. I could not imagine I would just go off and leave her. And then Otto, who kept an eye on me, came to visit me one day. And I told him, I met this young man, I quite like him. And he asked me to marry him. But of course, I'm not because I go back to Amsterdam, to Muti. And then he got a bit embarrassed and he said, you know, we have fallen in love as well. And once you get settled, we like to get married. So I went back to this young man and said, you can marry me now, which we did. We went, in, we went to Amsterdam in 1952 and got married. And Otto and my mother got married a year later in 1953. And I must say, I've never seen a happier couple than those two. They really loved each other and helped each other to get through this difficult period of their life. But then when we got three little girls, they became the best grandparents you can imagine. So we had to get a family. So um, this is my story in a very, very small nutshell. Um, I wrote three books. The Promise is a book which um, I don't think you will see it, but I think you probably, all the books are in, in the British Library. The Promise is a story about Heinz. And recently I have decided, um, you know, uh, Anne, everybody knows about Anne, but to make Heinz as well a known person that people remembered who he was, because that what my father promised him, I made it with an American filmmaker, an animation film, which we are working on now. And I hope it will be finished at the end of this year. So thank you very much. Um, please read the books if you want to know more about it, because there's a lot, lot more. And um, I'm now 91 years old and I spent from, from 19... End of 1980, I spent my life going around many, many countries to talk about the atrocities that happened and that people learn from it, that it will not happen again. So there is a lot more to be done for everybody. And the Anna Frank Trust is one of those organizations who try to change the world for a better world. Thank you very, very much. I can't see you, but I'm sure you have listened to my story and hopefully you've seen, seen some of the paintings of my brother. Eva, I've listened to your story I don't know how many times now and every time I'm moved and hear new things and uh, I, I really, the thanks are from all of us to, to you. Eva, we do have some questions coming through from the audience. If that's all right, we have about 10 or 15 minutes for those questions. Uh, the first one I'm going to take is from Sara, and she says, thank you for sharing your story. And have you ever returned to the camp? Um, yes, I had the intention never, ever to go near anything like that. But in 1995, when... Um, Auschwitz was for the first time open to the Western power. There was a big memorial service there. And the Dutch television asked me to go there um, with my husband. I could go and um, make a program. And the first said, no way. And they said, well, we thought so, but um, think about it before again. And I was discussing it with my father and my mother. And I said, perhaps. I can let go once I go and see it. And there was one attraction. They said uh, some of the soldiers who had liberated your camp are going to be there. So, and you could go and say a thank you to them. And this is really what I wanted to do. And so I did go, but it was horrible. My husband, as soon as he set foot there, burst into tears and the whole film, he was crying. And um, it was for me, it was hard, but I thought at least I could f try to forget about it from now on. I've seen it and that's it. I had to have to let go. Thank you, Eva. 
Eva, the next question is from Leon, who's aged six. And Leon asks, do you remember the song that the soldier sang to you in that field kitchen? Oi, a song. So was, there, is there a, was there a song, is that right? When they, was there a song in the field kitchen when you were at Auschwitz? I don't remember you mentioning one, but I thought yes. perhaps I've missed I'm it. I'm sure there might have, but no, I don't remember anything like that, I'm afraid. No. Do you remember <laughs> perhaps that uh, you, you described the food? Do you remember other, as it were, moments of hope, joy, just after that liberation? Um, well, there was no music no, at food. that time. Um, food. Oh, food. Yes. If I remember food. Or, or other things, what, what started to bring you some joy you said, and hope a song, back into a your song. <laughs> Well, the Russian gave us cabbage soup, that I do remember very, mm. very clearly. Yeah, and in Auschwitz, no, there wasn't, there wasn't no. really much uh, anything, which, no, I don't remember really any food, besides the cabbage soup. And I know I found once, when we were in Auschwitz, I found on the ground a liver sausage, a whole liver sausage, which probably the Russians had lost, or I don't know. And I took it, and I wanted to eat nearly the whole, and my mother said, don't, 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 you get, you get ill of it. But I ate too much, and I was pretty ill. Thank you, Eva. Um, Eva, I have a question from Jane. Also, thanks you for sharing your story. Did you go to find your brother Heinz's paintings and how did it feel when you found them? What made you go and look for them? Yes, yes, of course. Of course we did go there. And it was a very, very emotional moment to go in this house and where they'd been betrayed and... Um, but we knew exactly where they were um, and people didn't want, there was a different people living there and they didn't want to let us in first as they said, just nothing in our house, but eventually they let us in and um, I knew exactly where it was in the loft. There was a, the, the planks and I could see a little space and I opened this and we found 30 paintings and a whole heap of poets poems as well and I looked at everyone and the favorite of it was um, Heinz sitting at his desk with his back facing the, the audience. Well done. And with, and there's with that, a lot that of, painting's on the screen now um, Eva. Yes, a lot of books around him, um, a globe on top and on the side is a calendar with 11 on it which is the day of my birthday. So when he painted this lovely painting he was thinking of me. That made me, of course, and my mother burst into tears. Yes, the paintings are saved. And a few years ago, I donated them to the Resistance Museum in Amsterdam, where they made a big exhibition and a display of them. And so many, many people go and see it. So to see what Hans has created. And here's the, on the screen now is the painting of the belfry and the bell and looking out over a beautiful flat Dutch countryside, it looks like. And what is so nice, you might not see it if it's so small, there's a little bird sitting on the windowsill and he wrote a beautiful poem. Um, little bird, where are you going? I wish I could follow you. And it goes on, you know, how he's wishing to be out in freedom. And um, yeah, so beautiful poems as well. And uh, the painting of a woman, um, Eva, who is the, who's the woman in the painting? That is my mother. Is. And the hands was of course not a painter, it never, never had done anything with oil, oil paintings. So my father to encourage him started to paint as well. He had never painted either. And this is a portrait of his wife, my mother. And it is really a very, very good likeness, beautiful. And I have a copy, the original is of course in the Resistant Museum, and I have a copy in my living room. And then there's one of the, the and, final and pictures of us. Yes, this is a beautiful picture, and it is very amazing that is 
um, the uncle, um, my mother's sister and her husband and her little son um, were able to come to England to Lancashire, to Darwin, a tiny little town. And they lived there with my grandparents. And when my grandmother was still alive, of course, when she saw the paintings and she said, but this is the room where I slept with my grandson. And I had never been there, never knew anything about this. And it was exactly the room. Amazing. Completely. Eva, I have there were 30, 30 artworks, uh, 30 paintings. Um, Eva, I have uh, a question from Susanna. Uh, she says, I cannot imagine how anyone could live in such terrible surroundings and be able to deal with it in Auschwitz. How do you think it has defined your life? Um, well, that's a difficult question. Like I said, when I came back, I was very depressed. And um, afterwards, when I got married, what I wanted was a big big, big urge to start a family. And unfortunately, it didn't work. And that is, I must tell you, um, in the camp, nobody had a period. Um, because in the liquid, we got bromide, which means that our female functions didn't work. So I couldn't conceive. So I was desperate, but eventually I had treatment and I got pregnant and my first daughter was born. And that was for me a big change in my attitude. It was in 1956, in my attitude, in my um, hope. And, um, and yeah, this helped me a lot to get over this terrible experience. And two years later, I got my second daughter and four years later, our third daughter. And like I said, we were a family again. And this really helped me to mm -hmm. get over this terrible experience. Because, yes, we have a question from Neve who says, um, uh, how incredible it is that Otto did not express hate and uh, how did you deal with the anger towards the evil of what happened? And it seems like ultimately that's your question, is it? It was about your family. What? How did you deal with the the hatred. How it's a hatred. hatred? Yeah. Um, How did well, you get through You know, that? after I had, for 40 years, I had nightmares till I started in 1986. So after 40 years, was the first time I spoke openly about what has happened, actually in an Anne Frank exhibition, which the first one who came to England and I was allowed to speak there. And it was difficult for me, I must say, very, very difficult, but it helped me. I could let go. So I lived another uh, 40 years after this, but, you know, so 40 years were, were really difficult. I tried to live a normal life, but I was very shy. I had all kind of nervous illnesses. Um, it, it, you know, if you go through something like that as a young person, um, you can't just get over it. But as I say, the last 40 years of my life, I, I, well, I did good work. I realized um, after I came back, people said never again Auschwitz. But of course, in the 80s, it started again. The wars, the persecutions, the prejudice. And so I decided after I spoke up, I am going to try to teach people. Um, that we have to change our attitudes. And this is what I've done for as well for 40 years now. I know I'm stuck at the moment, but I hope that eventually I can carry on. And it is unfortunately still necessary. Like Serena Frank's work, personally, I do as well very much individual work to try to change people's attitudes. And Eva, you, you've been you've been locked down in your your flat in North London, haven't you? But you've had both your vaccinations now, aren't you? So we're very glad to know that you're you're safe. 
Um, well, I uh, have the vaccination, but the other people haven't got yet. So we will still, we are still a bit stuck with this. We've got a way to go. Um, we have, you, I have hope. You know, you must never give up hope in any situation. There's always an end to every situation. Thank you, Eva. It, can I say to everybody watching, we've got lots of questions and I'm so sorry we haven't managed to get to all of them. I do have one last question, if I may, Eva, from the audience, which is from Benedicte. Uh, and they ask, what would you advise us to do to prevent hatred, bullying and discrimination? What would you advise the world to do to stop hatred and bullying and discrimination? Well, <laughs> the advice is not to feel this way, you know, I mean, we are all human beings. My husband always used to say, and I think that it is so right, we are just one race, the human race. It doesn't matter if we are um, yellow or pink or black. Um, we are all people, we all have the same mechanics, our bodies are all the same, we do the same work, we have the same birth, we have everything the same, and, um, and the same with religion. Religion is there to help people make a better life, to become better people, and people hate different religions, and we all want the same. All people, with the, the Jewish people, the Muslims, the Christians, um, the Hindus, the Buddhists, there are so many kind of ways you can have a God, but it's all for the better of people. And people hate each other if they're different. This we have to learn. We have to learn to accept each other for human beings, which we are. Eva, I can't think of more wonderful words to end on than that we're all human beings. Um, friends, visitors, guests at home, can I just say to you that some of Eva's story, some of the facts about the Holocaust are deeply disturbing. You may find yourself dwelling on this in the next day or two. If you do just talk, talk to somebody, do be in touch with a friend, a member of your family. Uh, just make sure that you tell somebody else. I heard Eva Schloss speaking the other night and this is what I heard, just so you, you share it. Uh, don't, don't let those things dwell uh, in, in you too. Uh, grimly, we need to both remember the seriousness of this and remember that extraordinary uh, humanity that you embody, Eva, um, so remarkably. Thank you, as ever, for telling your story so beautifully, so frankly to all of us. Uh, really, you are quite a remarkable human being. Thank you very, very much indeed. As, as soon as I can, I come to your schools. Just ask me, I'll be there. Or do get in touch with us at the Anne Frank Trust. We will, we will always make that introduction if, if, if we can. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And a special thank you to our guests, Ava, and also to Tim. Do remember to click on the tabs above in order to provide us with some feedback and also to buy Ava's, Ava's book. To find out more about the events that we're running, do have a look on our What's On pages. Thank you very much to those of you who joined us from the Living Knowledge Network. Thank you and good night.